today we're going to talk about something different duct air tightness duct air tightness is one of those things that we don't really take into consideration as a part of the building envelope but the fact of the matter is is that it connects to the building envelope and any leakage that occurs through ductwork can significantly impact the overall performance of the building envelope itself. So right now, let's talk with Joseph in relation to where the majority of issues can be with ductwork in a building envelope. Ductwork is a vital part of um, commercial building. It acts pretty much like our artery and vein, our blood circulation system. It delivers all the heating and cooling and all the exhaust air in and out of the occupied space. It's the same as what you want to do with your blood vessel. You don't want any leakage in there. Otherwise, you would run into all kinds of problems. So Joseph, from some of the inspections that we've done on these jobs where we've had to you know, use cameras and, and actually visually inspect, where are the major areas where these ducts actually leak? Well, most of the installer and builders, when we talk about duct leakage, they think about all these joints between two pieces of ductwork. But usually, if they are doing it properly, they put foam seal around and they put two pieces of duct together, bolt it, and then put clamps in the middle. That should be a pretty well sealed area. However, some of the area that most of the problem comes in those corner junctions where they, if they didn't put in sufficient mastic to seal up all the openings. And if you come over here and have a look at a joint like this, this area down here where they got three different pieces of duct joint together, they always have some holes in it. Unless for some really good quality duct installer and duct maker, they put a lot of mastic seal to make sure it's been sealed up. But a lot of the time, because of on-site restriction or the pressure in time to meet the target program, they may omit or not doing the work thoroughly. And that junction at the corners would become a problem. The other major issue is sometimes when the ducts being fabricated in the factories is in a perfect condition. But on site, we know that different trade, different people will move around your duct work and sometimes they may hit the corner and bam. As soon as that happens, the seal is not really sufficiently sealed. So, so the other area that's an issue there, Joseph, is that they don't put the cleats properly in areas where they might be really difficult to put them in. The other issue is, is that, you know, these Pittsburgh joins that Joseph was just talking about just a moment ago, on these bends, you've got these Pittsburghs on all sides. Whereas with a straight duct, you've only got the Pittsburgh on maybe two sides or maybe even with the smaller ducts on one side of the, or one corner of the actual duct. The other issue is, a lot of the time when the duct installer installing the duct work, there are some very tight area restricted. Usually it's between the duct work and the soffit of the slab, where you find it really hard to get into. If there is beams next to it, it's almost impossible to put a clip on the top side of your duct work. And the natural tendency, usually it should be sealed by gravity, but it's not always the case. If they tighten the bottom a bit too much, then the top will be open up. And obviously also the transitions from speed wall risers, from any plenums, uh, even plaster or riser liner risers, going straight into a ductwork, that transition can be really leaky. In fire rated area, usually we won't have too much an issue. But in ordinary part partitions where the duct will need to penetrate through, usually what you can see is the top part, the part of the plasterboard above the duct work, I rarely see them being covered up and sealed. So jo Joseph, how leaky are metal ducts on commercial buildings that you've seen? Well, it's a very wide range for some very good quality installer with stringent testing and checking regime, QA regime, they can get down to as low as 3%. But typically, we are talking about between 8 and 15% leakage in a more normal setting. But in some extreme cases, it can go about 35%. Wow, and what's building code require? The building code doesn't really have a prescribed requirement, but according to the Australian standard, um, AS4254, 
the requirement is 5% leakage. How much of that needs to be tested in a commercial building? Well, it's not required by the building code at the moment, but according to the Australian standard, they should at least type testing 10% of each type of, of duct. duct work. Okay, and what's usually the leakage rate for riser liners or speed wall risers? For those masonry or builder riser, so to speak, they don't really have a standard dictating what level of leakage is required. But it can cause havoc on it, well, if it's in, not done in right. In some extreme cases, we work on a couple of the masonry risers. The system is very simple. It's a garbage room exhaust riser, one inlet, one outlet on the roof within a 25-storey building. And we got zero fold, zero pressure down at the garbage room. Yep, so it's more than 100% leakage. What does it mean to have a percentage of leakage in ductwork? Leakage in ductwork is not as straightforward as a lot of other wastage because the energy requirement for generating the airflow is following a cube rule, which means a 5% increase in airflow would translate to 17% increase in fan energy. A 10% increase would be a 37%. In some of the worst case, if your ductwork is leaking at 35%, you are using an extra 140% of energy on top of the original design energy. So it's a huge implication in terms of fan energy requirement. In addition to that, it's not only you wasted 35% of your conditioned air, it also mess up with your control because you don't know where the conditioned air leaked to. In some cases, it may leak to the return air directly, which mess up with all the sensing and control system because the thermostat inside the room may tell you you need more cooling, but the return air temperature sensor in your chiller, in your air handling unit tells the system it's already cold enough so you got conflicting signals from the same system and a lot of the control system they just don't know what to do in those kind of cases so it can have a very huge um, energy implication yeah and there's other implications as well right there are other things that can affect the building envelope when it comes to duct air tightness yes because usually the ductwork are connected directly to your air handling unit is either in the refuge floor in the middle of a high-rise building or go all the way to the top to the roof um, plant room. Those areas, they are open and exposed to wind. When you bring the wind pressure into the whole picture, the situation become much more complex, complicated. And a lot of the masonry riser housing this kind of um, sheet metal duct, they also connect all the way to the top. And that becomes a major weak point in your um, building envelope. So some of these risers are completely open up the top. Yes. As well, right? Mm. So if you've got supply and return in the same riser? Um, usually they won't, but that's only usually. Yeah. But if they are adjust to one, adjacent to one another, and they only have a concrete block wall in between. Yeah. Concrete block wall, believe it or not, is extremely leaky. They can leak as much as 84 meter cube per hour per meter square at 50 pascal pressure difference. So if your supply and return duct is on either side and the sheet metal ducts are leaking, the leakage alone can generate higher pressure difference between the two risers and the conditioned air will just permeate through the block work. So look, air is something that we, we can't see what it's doing. So duct air tightness, absolutely pivotal for the operation of a building to operate efficiently and effectively. Now we know about the problem and the implication of leaky ductwork and rises, but what can we do? Um, efficiency matrix can get into the process to help you to get tight ductwork and rises. We are doing it in two different ways. For new buildings, we emphasize on um, prevention. Just like any good doctor, we would come in and check the integrity of the ductwork before you close that up. Make sure the key areas are sealed as much as possible to give you a better result. Not just the ductwork, because usually once you tell the duct installer someone is going to inspect their work, they would do it pretty good. 
For the builder risers, it doesn't matter whether it is speed panel, masonry block work, or riser liner kind of plasterboard system. Most of the contractor, when they're installing those systems, they don't have air tightness in mind. So the first thing we come onto the site is to meet with those contractors, let them know the importance. Education is always the key. And then we will inspect at least the first section that they do. Make sure they know what the details are, how to create a sealed um, riser. Some of the typical area is just like usually when people installing speed panel, for example, the top track, usually they don't seal pretty well. Mm. because it's hard to reach, it's fiddly, but if we in, um, explain to the contractor the need for doing that, why we need to do it, usually they do it pretty well. Yeah, it's an educational thing. I mean, the other thing is, is that because it's not a wall that's going to be seen by anyone, they, they tend to treat it even worse than a finished wall. Of I mean, course. that's the other thing. Like, if it's a finished wall, everything's meticulously corked so that it, it, it gets signed off for practical completion. Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, that's right. We also understand not every project have the luxury or lucky enough to get the inspection process right. A lot of the project already way ahead in the program and they can't go back in time to do it. We also offer a whole variety of um, remediation options. We don't give a one-size-fits-all solution. Before we advise you on which one to go for, we always do a thorough inspection of your ductwork. We have special kind of equipment, inspection camera that can allow us to do high quality, good resolution, detailed survey of the condition of all the joints and um, potential gaps and potential problematic areas. Yeah, so that, that can be beneficial in new construction as well as retrofit potentially. If you want to retrofit air tightness to ductwork or risers, we can provide the solutions to actually get that done in a cost effective way. So there's spray foaming. Spray foaming allows for you to close up large gaps parts within risers, especially uh, masonry or speed wall or, or even uh, riser liner sort of plaster risers. For heaps of tiny small little gaps, there's a system where we vaporise the sealant into the airstream and pressurise the area with it capped off on all ends. And the vaporised sealant would seek out where the leaks are because of the turbulence, it would create a sufficiently big lump to have enough momentum to start sticking into the wall around the leak. And once it, the process starts, it will build up until it seals the hole completely. It's a perfect solution for some of the hard to reach area like the ductwork already inside a precast yeah. riser, for example. So what's the size of the gaps that we can close in, in the automated vaporized sealant? The manufacturer's recommendation is up to 15 mil of gap, which is a fairly large gap considering sheet metal duct work. Yeah. But for builder risers, it's not too shocking to have gaps bigger than 15 mil. However, the system can seal up to 15 mil, but we don't want anybody to become complacent and treat it as a silver bullet because the less holes and gap in the ductwork system, the more easier we can bring it down to a tight state. And if we are talking about those ductwork leaking 35% plus, it can cost you a fortune to use that system to save it.